I'm reading the book by Kathy Davidson right now called Now You See It. Have you had a chance to look at that book yet? Um, I have cracked it, but I have to confess I haven't finished it, so. Well, in, in the book, she kind of, and, and I'm sure you know Kathy Davidson's work anyway, but she kind of talks about the, uh, the I guess, the divide between Clay Shirky on the one hand and Nicholas Carr on the other, and how they're both sort of, they're hyperbolic. They're both hyperbolic. So Carr is the guy, as we talked about in class, who wrote The Shallows, and he thinks the internet is making you stupid. And um, on the other hand, Shirky, cognitive surplus, and he thinks the internet is unlocking untold amounts of potential. She believes that they're bo they both have hyperbolic opinions. What do you think about that, about, about uh, what the internet is doing to our brains and whether or not, and, and where do you kind of situate yourself, I guess, in that conversation? So I think that, you know, I've been watching adoption and diffusion of technology for two decades now. And this is a very familiar pattern that mm -hmm. when a new set of technical capacities becomes widely available in the culture, there's this process of boosting and debunking the technology and really focusing on the technology as the site of action. Um, the, the problem I have with the overall frame, although the specifics of how the books takes them up, I don't, you know, there, there's a lot of details we could argue about, is that there's a technically determinist assumption built mm. into it. So when you look at technologies, they're not inherently good or bad, or they don't inherently make mm -hmm. you smart or stupid. Right. You know, we need to take responsibility for that ourselves. Mm. So what I don't like about technically determinist arguments is not necessarily whether they're right or wrong about how they're interpreting the facts, but what they tell you about human agency, mm -hmm. the story they're telling about human agency. Because when we look at how young people take up technologies, some of them look like they're doing Carr's version, and mm -hmm. some of them look like they're doing Shirky's version. Right. There's nothing inherent in the technology that says every person it's going to experience it in the same way. Mm. And yet these narratives become fights because what they're fighting about is who's right, but it's not a universal experience to begin with. So they both have pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it's partial is because they haven't started from the point of view of recogni recognizing the heterogeneity of human experience and how we take up technology. Right. And there are certain things that, you know, the technology nudges us to, or there's new capacities, which Clay is great about recognizing the new potential of technology. Right. Um, but unless you actually exercise your agency to take on that potential, you know, the scenarios don't come to play. How do you deal with information overload? This is something I think about a lot because I feel, in a sense, sometimes I get information fatigue, you know, and I think about all of the different streams of information and that there's more information than I could possibly ever read being pumped out of the internet in one day, you know, let alone, you know, what you could you could never read it in your lifetime and it's being created in one day. How do you deal with what's your position on on the idea of overload of the internet overloading with information and how do you deal with the massive amounts of information on the web? Yeah, I think it's a huge new challenge that we have. So with new capacities comes new responsibility, which is part, part of my argument as to why we really need to move out of a technically determinist frame towards a human empowerment frame. Mm. So it's not like, you know, there's the, the information environment that we have today empowers us to do so many things, but we have to um, also take ownership of that power to use it effectively. Mm -hmm. And so some of the work that I found really helpful is Howard Rheingold's work on mm -hmm. infotension and attention management. Right. I think there's people who are starting to get smarter about thinking about information or technical or media literacy, not literally as having skills and knowledge, but about effective management of an environment and a tool set. And I think those directions are really promising because we're moving away from an era, of obviously, of information scarcity, where the challenge was to you know, acquire information and internalize it, to an era where the skills that are really going to help us make adapt, be adaptive is really our ability to focus attention in effective ways. And that's where um, you know, I think you're really hitting on one of the big challenges of our current 
um, information environment and one that we don't have really good norms and standards and mechanisms yet to cope with. Um, but I think there's, you know, definitely even looking at how, um, you know, Twitter becomes a way to manage a stream of information on the internet, you know, how people are really gravitating towards mm -hmm. um, social network sites as filtering mechanisms. I mean, these are definitely easily available tools, but they're not always the ones that from a learning perspective are optimized for, um, you know, the outcomes that we'd want um, mm -hmm. on the, you know, expertise development or civic engagement or other kinds of targets we may be wanting to hit. What do you think about students on laptops in lectures? I mean, because you're a hip researcher and you know all about, you know, students interacting with digital media, what is your reaction if you see a student you know, or students on Facebook during a lecture or let's say just on laptops. How do you deal with that? What is your opinion about that? I'd love to know. Yeah, so I think the whole issue of the laptops and lectures, the Facebooking during lectures, is really kind of a symptom of the culture clash between prior modes of instruction and today's learning styles. Right. So when you're in an ecosystem where information is abundant and social connection is persistent, right. then you're in a completely different instructional ecosystem when, than a system of information scarcity where you're trying to limit the flow of communication peer-to-peer. -peer. And so that lecture, the laptop in the lecture hall to me is like the icon of that culture clash. And so I actually don't teach lecture classes. I give talks, mm. um, but there's this, there's this you know, I don't know what the class you're in right now, but, you know, there's a real difference between people who are in an instructional environment by choice and people who are in an instructional environment by coercion. Mm. There's a lot of different frames that people are bringing to a space, even mm. before they walk in the door, that structures how that attention is being managed. Yeah. So when I give a lecture to adult professionals who have signed up for a seminar and mm -hmm. who are there to see me, that's a very different frame than if I'm teaching um, a required course at a university. Yeah, you know, but in, in Sherry Turkle's book, uh, Alone Together, for example, she talks specifically about what you just mentioned, which is like when you're at a convention, because I just went to Educause in Philadelphia. Yeah. Were you there? Or no, 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 but I know what you. I know the debate you're talking about. Like yeah. people are talking about that same issue in meetings, and in lectures for right. sure. But I think the the point is that what you want to be encouraging as a capacity is the ability to filter, manage attention, and to make effective learning choices. Mm -hmm. And so, to the extent that which you can structure context in which people are making those effective choices in context of autonomy and agency that are properly directed, that mm -hmm. seems like a good thing. Right. If you're if you're in a situation where, you know, the the thing that matters is bums on the seat, mm -hmm. not minds um, you know, in not engaged minds, then mm -hmm. You know, you're dealing with a different dynamic, so I think the strategies differ. But, you know, I think we are getting smarter about that. I mean, I'm seeing a lot more explicit discussion about it, like lids down periods and meetings, mm -hmm. um, instructional strategies where you're using social media in the course of a uh, um, lecture. Right. So that the, um, the students or the attendees are not in a passive position and are actually able to participate and engage in ways that I think manage attention effectively um, while also bringing more people into the mix um, interactively. So I think there's definitely ways of doing it, but you know, I, I do think that there are moments when we do want to insist on collective attention in a physical space. Um, but we want to do it in the context that that's really what the meaningful interaction should be.